Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much again for the opportunity to gather in this place, to gather in this room. As I say numerous times, uh, God, there's nothing special about this place, but it's, uh, there's something special about what you want to do in it because there's something special you want to do in our hearts. So God, I believe that this morning. I know I'm not the only one in believing that. God, I pray that as we read this passage and as we are reminded of uh, the long journey that we've taken through this book so far and all the different truths and things that we have seen, God, I pray that, um, let's just be honest, it's easy sometimes to not believe it, to read it and to um, think that it's true, um, but not to really live as though it really is. And so, God, I, I pray this morning that you would help our hearts to, to truly believe what it is we see in this passage. I pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see the beauty of Christ, even in this Old Testament passage. You give us ears to hear your voice this morning in a clear uh, way. And that, Lord, you would soften our hearts to receive this trans transforming word uh, this morning. God, I pray that as we leave this place, we would never be the same, because we will see you uh, in a clear and powerful way this morning. God, we ask all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning to you all. Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is John Alexander. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here uh, at Gracia Journey. And so if we haven't met yet, I'd love the opportunity to do that after the service. Uh, it's going to be kind of hard if you're one of the ones watching online, but if that's you, uh, I would love to contact you just, um, or connect with you rather. Uh, just shoot us a message on our church Facebook page and we'd love to meet you that way. And then again, we always have the online connect card uh, for those who are guests and uh, who would like to get connected. Uh, but it's always so good to see you guys. Um, we all know those who are sitting in the room and who are a part of Grace Journey, but we are not a perfect church. Uh, and by that, I mean that we're not a perfect people. Uh, when we leave this place and we live our weeks, we know that that, that reality is looming large uh, during our weeks. And so we know very well that we are not perfect. Uh, but, but thanks be to God, we don't have to be perfect, do we? Because we are here as a church and as a people, not because we are perfect, but because we have a Savior who is perfect and was perfect on our behalf. That's never an excuse for us to, to sin lightly, uh, but it is reassurance that even when we falter and fail, uh, God is in control. He's sustaining us and he has saved us. And so that's a great reminder for us this morning. And so if you're here and, or you're watching online and you're not a perfect person, uh, you can feel at home here uh, because you're not alone. Uh, we're all in this together. As a church, we make it our rhythm uh, to regularly walk through uh, whole books of the Bible. Uh, we do this because we believe that in the Bible, God speaks. The Bible is God's word. The same God of the universe that spoke in the whole universe was, uh, came into existence is the same God who speaks to us through the Bible. And so as we open it each and every week and we read it, it is the most important thing that we do. All the songs we sing are about his word. All the sermons you will hear from this pulpit are about his word. Because at the end of the day, it's God's word that is of supreme value and worth. And only it can transform us in the way that we need to be transformed. And so that's why we make it our habit to regularly walk through whole books of the Bible. Because we want to see not just what God has said, but we want to see also how he has said it. And that's where context is key. And so with that being said, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the eighth chapter of the book of Esther. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, that's okay. If you don't have a smartphone and can't pull it up that way either, uh, that's okay too. Uh, we'll have it up on the screens uh, above me. We are, in, uh, we are eight weeks into a nine-week series on the book of Esther, the story of Esther. And in this story, we see God's subtle sovereignty. And what I mean by that and what we've meant by that is that even behind the scenes of a story that never even once mentions God, it's kind of strange that a book that never mentions God is in the Bible when the Bible is a book about God, supposedly, right? And so it's really unique and interesting that in a book like Esther where God is never even mentioned, that we see him working behind the scenes. We see him working underneath the surface to accomplish uh, his plan of salvation and deliverance for his people. And so, yeah, we don't hear his name, but we do see his invisible hand at work. We've seen that in all the chapters leading up to this morning. We will continue to see it this morning, and we will continue to see it next week as we wrap up our series. And so with that being said, once you've found your way to chapter 8 of the book of Esther, and if you're able to do so, would you please stand uh, to your feet with me in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. Hear the word of the Lord as found in the book of Esther. Chapter 8, starting in verse 1. On that day, King Ahasuerus, who gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, 
which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite in the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews, in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned at that time, in the third month, which is the month of Savan, on the 23rd day, and an edict was written, according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews, to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name, name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy to kill and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples. And the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. This is God's word. You may be seated. There's just something so special and significant um, and so satisfying, really, about an unexpected turn of events, isn't there? The moment when something that seemed to be inevitably leading to one um, conclusion ends up leading to the in completely different conclusion against all expectation. Now, we know this concept by a number of different names uh, and, and words, names like bombshell and curveball. And we also know it by certain phrases like the tables have turned and out of left field, right? But what these different words and these different phrases all have in common with each other is that they all refer to a reversal of fortunes, a reversal of expected outcomes. To say it another way, they're plot twists, right? Now we see these kind of twists most notably in the movies that you and I watch. You can probably think of a few at the top of your head as I'm saying this, um, but they're all over the place, these plot twists. They're in kids' movies like Coco. They're in um, like psychological thrillers like Shutter Island. They're in uh, suspense movies like, um, like uh, The Village or The Sixth Sense, uh, both of those by M. Night Shyamalan, which is hit or miss in his movies, but that's neither here nor there. It's not the point. But the reality of it is we see these plot twists all over the place. 
But I think one of the most iconic and maybe the most well-known of these plot twists comes in a classic movie, a, a, a movie like Star Wars. Uh, the Empire Strikes Back. And some of you may say, wait, Pastor, hold up. That's not a classic. That was new uh, when I was still young and stuff. But let's just be honest. We all know it's a classic, whether it means it's old or whether it's just classic. Um, it is what it is. And so in that movie, Star Wars, uh, The Empire Strikes Back, uh, we all know the scene. Luke Skywalker comes. He's fighting Darth Vader. And then while he's fighting Darth Vader, uh, he gets his hand cut off. And then he says, you know, to Darth Vader that, you know, Vader killed his father. Uh, and then that momentous um, occasion where Darth Vader reveals that, in fact, he didn't kill Luke's father, but is Luke's father. And we all know the line, right? Luke, I am your father, right? We're all familiar with that. Um, and actually looking it up just to make sure I had it right this week, I actually learned that it's not actually Luke, I am your father. It's no, I am your father. But that's not the point either. The point is that we all know what a good plot twist looks like. And we, know, and, we, and we know how to appreciate it when it comes to us. Whether it's in the movies that we watch or the books that we read, uh, we can appreciate them. But these plot twists were not a modern invention. And they're not limited to fictional stories. Plot twists are often the stuff of real life. And I think that's why they are so satisfying when we find them in movies and literature, because they, they appeal to an inner longing within our hearts to see a world where all the wrongs are made right, where those who break the rules in order to get ahead are held accountable, and where the, the world is turned upside down. And so in the story of Esther, we've been given one of the most stunning and most vivid examples of a plot twist. It's a plot twist that came in the past, but it is a plot twist that points us forward to an even greater plot twist, to an even greater reversal of fortunes that would come in the future. Leading up to chapter 6 of this book, there, things were looking grim for God's people. Because of Haman's decree of death, the Jews were condemned to die, destined for complete and utter destruction. But in chapter 6, there was an unexpected turn of events, a curveball that came in the form of the king's sleepless night. So while God's people were sleeping and his enemies were awake scheming, God was working. He was not going to abandon his people, but was protecting and preserving them. And at that moment of the king's sleepless night, a reversal began to take place. The tables had officially turned. Because up to that point, Haman had been meticulously setting up these dominoes of destruction that were intended to all fall on God's people at one time. But in the process of setting up these dominoes, those very same dominoes ended up coming back the other way and falling on him instead. And so from chapter 6 forward, the story shows us that God's people were no longer destined for destruction, but now were destined for deliverance. And so as we work our way through this passage this morning, we're going to do so in three scenes. And I'll give them to you as we go along. In the first scene, uh, it comes to us in verses 1 and 2, where we see a long-awaited promotion. Now, chapter 8 picks up right where chapter 7 left off and right where the preceding chapters, not just chapter 7, left off. Because if you go back and you look at the beginning of chapter 3, Haman was first introduced and he entered the scene at the precise moment you and I would have expected to read about Mordecai's promotion after he had saved the king's life. But we don't read those words. Instead of reading about Mordecai's well-deserved promotion, we read about Haman's high position, he was promoted, and for reasons that were not told. How did he rise to this supreme position in the, in, in the empire? We haven't a clue. The author doesn't tell us. But he was promoted, and he became the king's right-hand man, the second in command over all the Persian empire. But because of his injured pride, after a public display of disrespect for Mordecai, Haman issues his decree of death at the end of chapter 3. And he issues it against all Jews, young and old, women and children. But then in chapter 5, we see another public display of disrespect from Mordecai. And Haman decides that he can wait no longer to put this insolent man to death. And so he stays up all night constructing a 75-foot high spike, which he intends to use to impale Mordecai on the following day. But then comes chapter 6, and the tables have turned. The first domino, so to speak, has been turned over. Haman was up all night planning how to humiliate Mordecai. But the king had been up all night trying to figure out how he could honor that very same man. 
And then that chapter ends with Haman, Haman having to parade Mordecai around the city while proclaiming how great and important he is to the king. And this was not what Haman had in mind. Not in the slightest. But things were only just getting started. And so then we come to uh, chapter 7, which we saw last week if you were here for it. And the dominoes continue to topple over one after another. Haman thinks that he can bounce back from this temporary setback. But, quite unexpectedly at a dinner party, uh, he gets simultaneously exposed as a traitor and then executed as a criminal. Exposed by Esther and then executed by the king. And on that night, right after the meal, sweet poetic justice was served. Haman gets impaled on the very same spike that he had constructed for, for Mordecai. And so to sum up that little review, in chapter 3, we are introduced to Haman. And we're like, hey man, what's up? And then comes chapter 7, and we're like, hey man, apparently you're what's up. Because you're on top of that spike. And so pardon the dad joke, but I've been making them since long before I was a dad. So uh, bear with me. Anyways, let's get back into it. So now we're back to chapter 8, and we read these words in verses 1 and 2. And so look with me in your Bibles. It says, on that day, and, it, and this means the same day that Haman was hanged, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And so here in these opening verses, I want to make three observations. Observation number one, Haman's possessions are given to Esther. We see this in verse one. It was not unheard of for the estate of a traitor to be confiscated by the king and then redistributed um, as he saw fit. And so in this case, it was only fitting that the house of Haman would go to uh, one of the people that he had threatened. And so what better way for the king to show his bride that he loved her uh, than by giving her the house of the man who had threatened to take her life and the life of her people. So that's observation number one, Haman's possessions. Observation number two, Esther's Jewish identity is fully revealed. We see this at the tail end of verse 1. Now throughout this story, you'll remember if you've been with us or you've read it before, the author makes a concerted effort that he repeats time after time uh, to show how Esther had concealed her identity multiple times. During her interview process, you may recall, she is never asked about her heritage, but neither does she make it known. She doesn't freely offer that information. In chapter 2, verse 10, she says, Esther, uh, we read that Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. But then even after the interview process, after Esther has been crowned the new queen, uh, she continues to keep her family tree hidden. In chapter 2, verse 20, we, we read that Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. Now five years go by. Between, chapters two, uh, between chapter 2 and the, ch and the chapters that follow after it. And in the meantime, we learn that Esther has continued, continued to conceal her identity, to keep it a secret. To the point that when she throws her back-to-back -back dinner parties, neither Haman nor the king have any clue of where she came from and that she herself is a Jew. And so talk about a curveball in the story. Up until chapter 7, all Esther seemed to do was distance herself from her people, push them further and further away. But starting in chapter 7, this begins to change. Instead of pushing them away from her, she begins to pull them close to her. She's identifying herself at long last with her people. But it isn't technically until chapter 8, this chapter, where Esther fully reveals what she had formerly concealed. And she does this when she discloses to, discloses to the king her family ties with Mordecai. What this means is that she made it known to him that he was her cousin. And what we already know from chapter 6, verse 10, is that the king already knew that Mordecai was a Jew. Which is why after uh, Haman comes to him in the, in the early morning hours and, and uh, the king says, Hey, Haman, what should I do for the man that I delight to honor? And then Haman thinks he's talking about him. And so Haman's like, you could do this, you could do this, you could do that. And then the king says, I like all that. That sounds great. Don't leave anything out. Do everything you just said, but do it to Mordecai, the Jew. And so we know that the king knew Mordecai's ethnicity. And now he knows Esther's as well. But it wasn't until that Esther identified with her people that she could plead their case and secure their deliverance. 
And this leads to observation number three. Haman's position is given to Mordecai. We see this in verse two. In chapter three, Haman received the promotion that Mordecai had deserved. But now at long last, the mistake is made right. And Mordecai is finally promoted. Now we had to wait till chapter two or chapter eight, verse two, uh, to read what we expected to read in chapter three, verse one. We had to wait five chapters, but Mordecai had to wait for five years. He had to wait for five years for this day to come. All the power, all the prestige that had been formerly enjoyed by Haman now belonged to Mordecai. The lives of these two men had now been completely swapped with one another. Previously, it was Mordecai who was doomed to die, but now Haman is the one who's dead. Previously, Haman was the one in the relationship with the king, but now Haman is the one in relation, or now Mordecai is the one in relationship with the king. Previously, it was Haman who had the king's signet ring, but now Mordecai has that signet ring. And so at this point in the story, Mordecai now has everything that Haman once had. And one by one, we see that Haman lost everything that was of value to him. Listen to chapter 5, verse 11 where Haman recounts for them, meaning his wife and his friends, the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above all the officials and the servants of the king. So catch this. Previously, Haman had boasted and bragged about his wealth, about his kids, about his career, his job. But in chapter 7, Haman lost his life. And none of that stuff really mattered anymore. <laughs> And in fact, even if it did matter, even those things are taken away because in chapters eight and nine, we see how he ends up losing those things too. In verse one of this chapter, he loses his possessions. He loses his wealth. They were given to Esther. In verse two, he loses his position. That career, that job was given to Mordecai. And then in the next chapter, which we're gonna see next week, he also loses his sons. And so over the course of these few chapters, Haman has lost everything that he spent his entire life pursuing. Suddenly and unexpectedly, he lost it all. And such will be the fate of all who, just like Haman, rebel against God and oppose his people. And so here's what's important for us to see. For the Christian here in this room, it should be a comfort for us, knowing that no matter what people in this world may do to us, on account of our relationship with Christ, God will hold all things and all people accountable one day. Everything that you lose in this life, you will not, you will not miss any of it, but you will be repaid, not because the, the repayment is the focus, but because of relationship with Christ is gonna make all of that stuff pale in comparison. Paul later on in the New Testament writes that all the sufferings of this world are not even worth comparing to the glories that await him. And so when we know what, what we see in this passage and when it, we let it sink into our lives, we don't let temporary setbacks and little defeats hurt us and depress us. But rather we see that God, yes, will one day hold everybody and uh, hold all, all people accountable. So it's an encouragement to the believer, but it's also a warning to the non-believer. It's a warning that, it's a warning not to waste your life pursuing things that in the end of the time will just be taken from you. No matter how much success you have in your career field, no matter how much money you're able to accumulate for yourself in your bank account, no matter how many kids, grandkids, great-grandkids you can have, as great and as glorious as those things may be, all those things won't matter in the end if you are opposing God and will one day face his judgment. And so it's a warning to get your heart right with God before it's too late to see that all these things that are given to us in this world, while we should be thankful for the blessings, should not, we should not let, elevate them to the point that they become our gods. Instead, we should see that of most importance is being in a right relationship with our God. In verses three through 14, we come to the second scene. And in it, we see the counter decree. Now at this point in the sermon, or at this point in the story rather, Haman is dead. He's long gone, right? At least by chapter. But Haman's decree is still very much alive. It's still looming large over the lives of the Jewish people. And unless something else is done, the Jews are going to be destroyed in the matter of a few short months. And so what does Esther do? Well, verse 3 tells us that she spoke again to the king. And here's why this is important for us to notice. Because after the events that had unfolded in the previous chapter, it's pretty safe to say that Esther's life was no longer in danger anymore. She was in the clear for the most part. 
Because as soon as the king was made aware that the queen's life was being threatened, he took swift and decisive action to eliminate that threat. And Haman was hanged on the gallows. As a result, Hester, Esther was now safe. She was secure. But her people weren't. They were still in danger. Haman's decree of death was still in effect. And so at this point, let's just stop and think about it. Put yourselves in Esther's shoes if you can. She's safe. She's right there with the king in the palace. Tall walls, thick walls, guards, soldiers to protect her. The king himself is going to protect her. So just think about it. How easy would it have been for Esther to say, well, you know, I tried. I already asked the king once to deliver my people, but, you know, now my job's done. My life's safe. You know, I'm, I'm good, so I'm just going to leave it at that and let, let um, things fall where they may. But this isn't how Esther responds. Instead, she picks up right where she left off in the previous chapter, and she makes her request known. She says in verse 3, uh, we see in verse 3 that she fell at his feet, that she wept, and that she pleaded with the king to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite in the plot that he had devised against the Jews. Now, early in the story, uh, it w um, after Haman's decree was first issued, Mordecai went to the entrance of the king's gate. Maybe you remember this from chapter 4. And when he went there, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Because such displays of grief and sadness were not permitted inside the palace. You had to stay outside if you wanted to do that sort of a thing. The king's happiness would not be brought down by somebody else's sorrow. And so they kept all the unhappiness outside the palace walls. And so here, by falling at the king's feet, by weeping before him, and by pleading with him to save her people, Esther has broken palace etiquette. But she also doesn't care. Her people are more important to her than her own dignity. One preacher said it well when he said, Whereas before she had retained her royal dignity, always appearing as the stately queen before the king, she now threw herself down like a common beggar, crying and asking desperately for mercy for her people. So she is genuinely distraught over the fate of her people. This is not a show. This is, her not being, this is not her being a drama queen. This is her being genuinely concerned for her people. She now identifies with them. And until they're safe just like her, it's not possible for her to be anything but sad. But even though she's emotionally invested in securing the safety of her people, she continues to act strategically. Notice how she's careful to blame uh, the decree of death on Haman, not on the king. She keeps him out of, out of consideration. She takes the, the blame for that, the guilt for that decree, and she places it squarely on the shoulders of Haman. It was his plot, not the king's, even though he ultimately signed off on it. And so therefore, it's all Haman's fault. And then in verses 5 and 6, Esther repeats her request. And she does this strategically by piling uh, four uh, different clauses on top of each other. She says, if it please the king... And if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and implied, if I am pleasing in his eyes, then let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, which he wrote to destroy the Jews. In essence, she's telling the king, if you really love me, you'll do what I'm asking you to do. And so husbands, wives in the room, this trick is not new. It's been around for thousands of years, right? And we've picked it up. We've, it's been used many times since. But anyways, in verse 6, we get a further glimpse into Esther's genuine concern for her people. She asks two questions. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Notice how he, she uses the personal pronoun, my. These are my people. These are my kindred. Joyce Baldwin, an Old Testament scholar, says it well. She says, It is very moving to see the extent to which this young girl, who has everything money can buy, identifies herself with her own kith and kin, and is prepared to risk everything in an attempt to prevent the disaster that threatens them. Esther's really come a long way since we first met her in chapter 2. At that point, she did nothing but distance herself from her people. But now she's doing nothing but identifying with her people. Her fate and the fate of her people are now intertwined together. 
In verses 7 through 8, we see the king's reply to Esther's request. And he pretty much says to her, to paraphrase, I've already hanged Haman, and I've given you his house. What more could I possibly do for you? After all this, Esther was asking him to reverse what was an irreversible decree. She was asking uh, for something to be done that was impossible. And even if the king had wanted to, he could not undo what had already been done. It would have been the equivalent of taking a, a bag of sugar, dumping it into a sandbox, stirring it around with a stick, and then trying to extract the sugar back from the sand and put it back into the bag. Theoretically, it was possible, but practically it was impossible. It could not be revoked. And so even though the king could not reverse the earlier decree, he could permit Esther and Mordecai to craft a counter decree. And that's exactly what they do. They couldn't undo the first decree, but they could issue a second one that counteracted it. And so in chapter 3, the king had given Haman his signet ring. And he had given Haman his permission to do whatever he pleased. But now here in chapter 8, he has done the very same thing for Esther and for Mordecai. And you would think at this point in the story, knowing how it turned out for Haman, that the king would have learned his lesson at this point. But he doesn't. He's just willy-nilly doing the best that he can, but he's still a fool, even though he bears the, the greatest power in the entire empire. What follows in verses 9 through 14 is intended to sound strangely familiar to us. It's intended to sound familiar as these words ring in our ears. Because these verses, which record Esther and Mordecai's actions, almost perfectly parallel Haman's earlier actions as recorded in chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. In those verses, Haman was the one who was issuing the, dec the decree. Now in these verses, Esther and Mordecai are the ones who are issuing their counter decree. Listen to the words of chapters, uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. These aren't on the screen, so I just encourage you to listen to them. And if you were here before, you'll remember them. It says, Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. And an edict, according to all that Haman had commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Now, if you've got your Bibles open with those words in mind, listen again to verses 9 through 14 of this chapter. The king's scribes were summoned at that time, in the third month, which is the month of Savan, on the 23rd day, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. On one day, throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples. And the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa. Why would I read those two extended passages all over again? We saw it a few weeks ago when we, read, when we looked at chapter 3, and then we just read it again a moment ago um, as we read the passage for this morning. So why would I bother rereading these two large sections? Because the parallels are so numerous that there's no way to summarize it other than just to read through them again. 
And so hopefully in hearing them, you're probably thinking, isn't he reading the same thing two times in a row? That's kind of the intended focus. That's kind of the intended purpose here. The author is making a point, and that point he intends to be unmistakable. And so when given the chance to craft their counter decree, Esther and Mordecai, they pretty much just plagiarize what Haman had put together in the first place. They're like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's just reverse it a little bit. All right? So they're not even creative at all here. All right? If, they, if anything, they've got a lawsuit coming their way because they've plagiarized the whole thing. And so the author's point is clear. Esther and Mordecai have now fundamentally undone everything that Haman had done. They had dismantled every last bit of it. Now, they may not have been able to revoke or to reverse the earlier decree, but they could level the playing field. And that's what they do. Rather than having to sit idly by and just be slaughtered, the Jews were now allowed to defend themselves and their families from attack. To be clear, the, the counter-decree didn't prevent the Jews from being attacked, but it did permit them to fight back in self-defense. And so any Persian who was living in the empire and who was thinking about, well, maybe I could, I could probably get a few things if I take advantage of Haman's first decree, any, Haman, any uh, Persian living in the Persian empire would have now had to stop and think twice about that thought. Because he wasn't just going to be able to do it and not, been, not experienced opposition. If he did that, he was also doing it at the risk of his own life and the life of his own family. And so any Persian had to think twice about this. And so in this way, the counter decree largely removed the incentive to obey the original decree. It didn't eliminate the threat, but it did add the following warning. If you bite them, they're going to bite you back. If you fight them, they're going to fight back. And if you follow Haman's decree, then you may need to be prepared to suffer Haman's fate as well. And so as a result of this decree by Esther and Mordecai, the powerless Jews were now empowered. Instead of being a Persian punching bag, they were now permitted to throw punches of their own in self-defense. And so while much of the language is the same between these two decrees, notice that Haman's decree was offensive. But Esther and Mordecai's decree was defensive. Unlike the Persians who were allowed to attack any Jew living in the Persian Empire, the Jews were not allowed to attack whoever it was that they wished. Instead, they were only allowed to defend themselves against those who rose up to attack them. And so, by means of this counter-decree, God's people were now destined, no longer for destruction, but now for deliverance. Word of this news was then sent out to the furthest extent of the empire, and it was sent out by mounted couriers, which would have been the equivalent of our modern-day male, male men and male people. In chapter 3, Haman had slapped a postage stamp on his decree, and he sent it out in what would have been the equivalent of standard shipping. But now here in chapter 8, Mordecai sends out his decree with what would have been the our equivalent of same-day shipping. And so Amazon wasn't around yet back then, but Mordecai did his best to get this word out there even quicker than Haman's original decree had gotten out there. He expedited it because he wanted this good news to get out quickly. There was no time to waste. This news was just too good to delay. Now for those of us who are Christians who are living on this side of the cross, that same thought should ring in our brains. We have a great message to proclaim as well. We have even better news to proclaim. It is not a message that we can afford to, to, to delay and hold back, but it's one that we need to send out, send out quickly. In verses 15 through 17, we come to the third and final scene, and in it we see the celebration. This decree was too good not to send out, and it was also too good not to celebrate. And so these concluding verses, just like the verses before them, largely parallel the previous, uh, a previous passage in the book. Right after Haman's decree in chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, repeat and recount for us how after Mordecai had learned everything that Haman had, had planned to do to him and his people, that he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and then the Jews did the same thing. And it says um, in the first uh, few verses of that chapter that in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. And then now we read verses 15 through 17 of chapter 8, which come right after Esther and Mordecai issue their counter decree. 
and we see that, that then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a, gold, a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. So just note the contrasts, because there's a lot. Previously, Mordecai wasn't allowed into the presence of the king. Now he's coming from the presence of the king. Previously, Mordecai was wearing sackcloth and ashes. Now he's wearing royal robes and a golden crown. Previously, he was clothed in shame. Now he's clothed in glory. And so in language that's reminiscent of chapter 1, where we read about the king's uh, elaborate feasts, and all the curtains and the decor are described with this articulate language. The colors are recounted for us. The materials that all these things are made from in the palace are recounted for us. But in this point, in this chapter here, Mordecai is now the one that's portrayed in all the splendor of the king's palace. So previously it was the curtains that we are told the colors of. But now it's the colors of, him, of Mordecai's royal robes that are told to us. Previously, it was the citizens of Susa who were thrown into confusion. But now confusion has given way to celebration. Previously, it was the Jews who responded to Haman's decree with four types of distress, feast or, uh, fasting, weeping, lamenting, and sackcloth. Now it's the Jews who respond to Esther and Mordecai's decree with four types of delight, light, gladness, joy, and honor. And so again, as the author does so many times, he's showing how everything has been reversed now. The tables have turned. After Haman's decree, Haman sat down to feast while the Jews fasted. Now it's the Jews who feast while Haman is no longer even in the picture. And so it's not surprising then that we read in verse 17 about how many of the Persian people declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. They had seen just how quickly the tables could turn and how they had turned on Haman. They had now seen firsthand how Esther and Mordecai, two Jews, had essentially reversed what was in theory irreversible. And such a re realization sparked fear in many of the Persian people. Because on, in one hand they held one decree issued by Haman, who was now dead. And then in the other hand they held a second decree issued by Esther and Mordecai, who were now the ones in control and in power. And so the implication was clear. To stand with Haman was to share his fate, but to stand with the Jews was to be spared. And so by saying that they declared themselves Jews, the author doesn't mean that many Persians converted to the Jewish faith. Instead, it simply means that many of them recognized that it was no longer advantageous to oppose God's people, but now more advantageous to stand with and support them. And then that's how the chapter ends. And so Haman's decree is still in effect. But now, so is Esther's and Mordecai's counter-decree. The only thing left to do now was to wait. To wait for that predetermined day to come and to see how the Persian people would respond. Would they attack the Jews or would they leave them alone? You have to come back next week to find out. But as has been the case throughout the story, we are left on a cliffhanger. But in many ways, the outcome has already been revealed to us, hasn't it? Once destined for destruction, the Jews are now destined for deliverance. There's no question remaining about that. So, what are we to make of all this? What relevance, if any, does this have for us in the short amount of time that I have left? Well, in this story, and particularly in this chapter, we see God working on behalf of his people to secure their deliverance from certain destruction. And in seeing him orchestrate their deliverance, we're reminded of an even greater deliverance that would come 500 years later. 500 years later when Christ was crucified on behalf of sinners in order to secure our deliverance. Like the Jews living in the Persian Empire, you and I were condemned under a decree of death that we could not escape. One that we deserved because of our sin because of our rebellion against a holy and righteous God. Like Haman, we too deserve to die. 
but Christ took our place. Like Haman, we deserve to die, but Christ died for us. He was hanged. Not on a spike, not on a gallow, not on a stake, but on a cross, a Roman cross. But unlike Haman, Jesus did not die for his own sin. He died for your sin. He died for my sin. And because he died, you and I can live. The cross of Jesus Christ is God's counter decree to our condemnation. Christ's condemnation was our justification. And so instead of being destroyed, we had been delivered. At that moment when God the Son gave his life on the cross, God the Father secured our salvation. And as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Because of Christ, each and every sinner who calls out to God in repentance and faith can receive the salvation that he secured. Just like Esther identified with her people, Christ identified with us. At the incarnation, Christ took on our flesh. At the crucifixion, he took on our sin. He paid the penalty that you and I deserve because of our hostility towards God. It wasn't until that Christ identified with sinners, such as us, that we could identify with a Savior such as him. But that's precisely what he's done to the glory of God alone. Just like Esther and Mordecai, we have a message to share, don't we? But it's not a message of physical deliverance. It's the message of an even greater deliverance, a spiritual deliverance, a deliverance from God's righteous wrath against our sin. And like cur couriers of the king, we have good news to proclaim. Deliverance from destruction has been secured. It's been accomplished. This is a message that's too good to contain and it's too important for us to delay. We must go out to the ends of the earth and herald this good news, just as Christ commissioned us to do. Just like all the Jews and all the citizens of Susa, we too have a reason to celebrate. But our reason is even greater than their reason. Our salvation, our spiritual and eternal deliverance has been secured. Because of Christ, we have gone from destruction to deliverance. It's all because of Christ. It's all by grace. And it's received by faith in him and his work alone. And so if you're here, in this, morning, here this morning and you've believed in that, let's celebrate in just a moment as we sing. Let's proclaim the, the majesty of this great God that came to secure our salvation, to deliver us from a decree of death and destruction. Let's sing his praises as loudly as we can with masks on our faces. But then also, if you're here in this room and you have not trusted in this Christ, see the warning that's in this passage. See the invitation that is in this passage. It was too late for Haman, but it's not too late for you. By calling out to God in repentance and faith, you too can be delivered from the destruction you deserve and that we all deserved. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this message from your word. God, I pray it's, it, that you would help us to see, if we haven't already, that this passage which recounts for us almost just like a history lesson. It's easy for it to become just that. To see how you in the past delivered some people from certain destruction. It's easy to see it and just stop there. But God, I pray that we would see that how their, their deliverance points us forward to our own deliverance. A deliverance that you secured on the cross when you gave your life as a substitute for sinners. So God, your wrath is coming. And I pray that we would know that to be true. That believer and non-believer alike would know this and would prepare for that day. But I pray for the believer that you would give us comfort knowing that yes, that day of judgment is coming. But the penalty of that judgment has already been squarely placed on the shoulders of Christ who took our sin upon himself and whose sacrifice we received by faith. God, I pray this morning that it would be a powerful reminder to us of the salvation that has been given to us. God, that we would respond joyously in praise and adoration and gratitude, that there would be a celebration here in this place, but even more importantly, that there would be a celebration in our hearts and that our celebration would continue as we go out this week into this world as heralds bearing this even greater message of deliverance. And that, Lord, you would help us to proclaim it boldly and unashamedly to all we come in contact with. God, we thank you again for your kindness, your grace, and your salvation. 
And it's in the name of your son we pray.